Yeah, man. Uh, uh, life. Life and things. Crap, I forgot to turn off my my things. Like that. Cool. Good. Yeah. Great. Great stuff. Okay, good stuff. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's been really good at that. All righty. Well, uh, you want to start the show then? Yeah. Give me one second. Give sure. Second. Take your time. Take your time. I am definitely just going to be refreshing this page and wondering why any of the things that are supposed to be on it are not on it. <laughs> are indeed not on it. This is just, you know, because with the Opal, I, uh, I set up the audio side of it, but not the networking side of it. And now. Yeah. I know last week we had some network issues with the Wisp, and now I don't know if that messed up anything with that. Oh, maybe that's another group different message I should send out. Uh, how is the uh, how's how's the MR bubble going? Oh wait, I guess he's he's voice to texting. Man, sorry. Yeah, it was a little. It was it was a little faster. It was a little faster for me to voice to text it than type that out. Yeah. Um. Uh. Sorry, you were asking. Oh, the bubble. How's the bubble? Uh, it's it's going all right. You know. Um. I think. Uh, uh, current events with withstanding. Um. I think I think it's going well. You know. Um. Everybody is excited to. Um. I think I think some people are excited to just see other people again. Uh, I'm sure the Modern Rogue guys are glad to be recording more episodes because I know that they yeah. had a chance to do that since last time. Um, and yeah, you know, we're we're just you know trying to make trying to make the most out of it because uh, that last one we did was about a month and that was way too long. And so this one's only supposed to be about two weeks, maybe a few days longer. Um, but now, I thought you guys had gotten uh, or Modern Rogue had gotten over the holidays uh, in the last bubble. Uh, is this just for more padding past that, or or have have things kind of not shaken out from the first, the super long bubble? I I don't know. I I don't know how much they actually do have in their backlog. I know, um, at one point maybe it was after that first bubble, where we we kind of closed the set and and tried to film a bunch of stuff at once. Uh, it had seemed it had seemed like we'd made some pretty good progress. The same with the second one. Um, but I think with the ad uh, stuff, when when we get advertisers who want a sponsor a video, I think that uh, kind of kicks in and we end up upping our output a little more than than we expected. So, uh, uh, so I don't know the answer to that question. I w I also would have thought we were good until the holidays, but you know something comes up. Oh well, we want to throw in a video. Oh, can we can we do this? Can we do that? Um, and so I think that makes it tough. It makes it tougher than like Scam Nation, which is def definitely just once a week. Um, yeah. Versus, uh, oh, great. Uh, uh, versus uh, Modern Rogue, which sometimes there's two a week. Sometimes there's there's many a week. Um, sometimes yeah. there's just one. So, all right. Um, I I'm hearing beep, 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 beep. I'm hearing that uh, we might be good to start the show. Is that is that is that accurate? Okay, I'm getting word that that is accurate. Yes. Okay. Great. Cool. Okay, well, then we will start the show, Andrew, in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Gentlemen, we've been robbed. What? What? How? Theft has happened. What theft? Who theft from? No one is allowed to thieve from me. It's against the law and order. It's a big theft. Big theft. All right. Uh, well, hey, I mean, look, I, 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 I think uh, we need to get to the here. bottom of this. Lights are still here. Computers are still here. All right. My, my initial visual assessment is that nothing in this specific room has been has been thieved. Justin, are you noticing any valuables, goods, technology? To... I'm gonna paint a picture for you. Okay. Imagine you buy yourself uh, a Nintendo Switch, right? You get it. You're excited. You open it up. There's the Switch. 
there's the left part of the con- of the controller, right? Yep. I forget what they call them on those. Joy cons. Joy con. Yeah, I've got one sitting in my desk here. I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> and the, but the right one's missing. Ah, oh, you got to use the right one. The yeah, right maybe. one's got the sensor and the motion stuff in it. <gasps> okay. Well, imagine you got the right one in the in the middle, and you didn't know there was a left one. All you're, you're always playing games with one hand. You're like, oh, okay, cool. I guess it's what it is. And one day you go to a friend's house and you see they've got two, and you're like, like what, what the hell? What? I thought you had to buy yeah. the other one. Imagine you got a Han Solo action figure, and you didn't know that he came with a blaster. And then you eventually find out that you have been blasterless this entire time. And b- bam, bam, you had, you had fun. It was cool. You played Han Solo adventures with your Han Solo action figure, and then you realize you also gave the blaster. Well, I would not be too happy about that for sure. I like, uh, you know, buyer beware with, with a lot of stuff, but no one likes to be taken for a fool. No one likes a bill of goods. No one likes to be uh, g- uh, getting given a ride, you know. Had the wool pulled over their eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, been been uh, down old Sham Road. We get a box of donuts. It says twelve donuts. We open it up, and there's like eleven donuts in there. Hey, that's that. Well, oh my God, because normally it's the other way. Normally you get the baker's does it. You get thirteen. Now you're you're not even at the uh, the, the 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 thing on 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 the box. That's Here, ridiculous. Here's one that we messed up. Here you go. Have an have an extra one. Here's what you ordered, and then something on top of it. Just an, we, an we messed extra. up. Something something like right. that. Wait, hold I'm, on. I'm already uh, mad, so Andrew. You you're bringing us through this hall of horrors of uh, uh, of understanding. I I, I got to imagine that this is springing from some real trauma. It is colossal. It's astronomical. Seems uh, astronomers were looking at Mars, and everybody's up on Mars. Let's go to Mars. Mars is cool. It's it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be like Palm Springs or, you know. Ibiza, whatever, it's going to be the thing. Let's hop on our spaceships and go there. Well, some astronomers have been paying some attention to Mars. And some of you know what Trojans are? Those are basically like asteroids that might be in the same orbital path as you are in. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. of course. Mars has got a couple Trojans. And they're looking at them, and one of them, one of them doesn't fit. One of them doesn't fit. You know, it's like you go on a trip, you know, and you come home, and you think things are missing, but you're not sure because you misplay stuff. And then the kid who lives down the hill from you, who's sort of kind of not really trustworthy, is talking to you one day, and you look down on his wrist, and you see a watch that looks exactly like your watch. Oh no, the bear! I, I thought he, I, I thought the bear stole my watch. No, no, but this is a true story. Actually, he stole my watch. Oh no, we got him. But, but anyhow, uh, I that happened in middle school too. A kid just wore my jacket the next day, and I'm like, dude, that's my jacket. It's for sure my jacket. And he's like, nope. Well, that's a peril like, well, too. Like that's rats. very like I stole a I stole a thumb drive from somebody as a kid, and oh, we just happened to have the same one. But not like clothing or uh, like jewelry, especially something that might be. Well, it was incorrect. a watch. It was a swatch, whatever. And I remember because I had this little scratch on the band, and he's standing there talking about something stuff. But I'm looking at that watch. And I'm like, I think that's my watch. You got a scratch I'm on it. I'm tell dad. I'm like. He stole my watch. Turned out that while we were gone, he had like broken into our house and stole a bunch of stuff. So anyhow, <gasps> oh my god! Yeah. And now he's stolen <laughs> Mars. Unbelievable. Twenty twenty no, will never not end. This, not this person. No. Okay. No. No. Mars is the thief. No. Mars. Oh wait, did Mars? We're looking After at these all asteroids. Of this attention and time. This is how the, it rewards us. We're looking at the asteroids following are in the same like the Trojans that Mars has, and one of them looks a little unusual. One of them looks a little suspicious. One of them looks a little bit lunar-like, a little little like our moon. And we think it may have been a lost twin of our own moon. <gasps> what? Moon tiny too? Twin. A tiny moon? So remember what happened with the Earth was like we had this, this body collided into the proto-Earth, spun off a bunch of lava and stuff and whatever, and molten rock and formed the moon. So the moon is part impact from another, another project. Sedna, whatever we called it, and then you have the moon itself, you know, which is what formed afterwards, right? This may have been related to that rock. Wow, is so that's it was not cool. That's ours. Shrapnel, the, 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 the shrapnel of that impact made it all the way to Mars. We we don't know if like maybe if this was before 
you know, and Mars got that part and we got this one, but I say we own the matching set. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter if UPS sent it to the wrong house. No. Yeah, we want it back. That's ours. All right. So how do we what do we do? We Let's throw take a it net back. over it, bring it on oh. back, bring it back now, y'all. <laughs> Uh, it's a second moon. What it brings up, though, is that we're able to do a lot of really cool things now. We're getting closer looks at asteroids and we're able to look at their compositions and make out details of them and, and things that just used to be sort of faint points of light that we can sort of study, you know, their orbital patterns, what have you, to figure out some details about them. We're getting a closer look. We saw that with Bennu, which we talked about before, which we just did a, a, a recovery mission to actually get some material from there. And now we're looking at, uh, by the way, it's uh, the asteroid in question is 101429-1998-VF31. <laughs> Catchy. Of course. Uh, oh, yeah. all of, I mean, my favorite VF31. All, 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 all the kids are going to have that lunchbox. We simplify it to 101429, okay? Mm. So it's a Trojan that follows behind Mars, and when they're looking at it closely, they said, this thing sort of stands out. It's part of a the, the rest of the group called the L5 Martian Trojans. <laughs> Just like, you know, I think that's something that uh, uh, our friend uh, Scott wrote for one of his Galactic Football League books. Yeah, right. Um, is, uh, it just stands out a bit. So it just shows you that, like, you can still see the evidence of the early solar system and the collisions and the impacts and things that sort of throw it into this array. We often have this idea of thinking that things in the sky are sort of have been sort of permanent or fixed, you know, forever. And now we know that's not true. And now we're seeing the evidence of like kind of the aftermath, the fingerprints of the early solar system are still there. Wow. So that's pretty crazy. And it, it's, it's, it's really amazing that we're, that we're just kind of discovering that and understanding that. And I, I think that is going to be just one of the benefits of us being up in space more uh, and, and, and the ease of use to it. When we, when we actually think about what, uh, cheaper access to the cosmos is it's really can uh, we should be measuring it in in some of these things like this just more of a knowledge of our natural world by way of being up there it, it's it's interesting because the, the one theory is that something may have collided with the moon when it was still forming and sent it far off until it reached mars orbit huh wow. which would you know be further proof that it is ours that something happened I and, think and that's, that's we're 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 just we're just making that canon, right? Like we're just saying, uh, let's file the paperwork right no. now. It's ours. Uh, I don't care who says what. Uh, we need it back immediately. We need to chip it. And we that's need to, one. We of need the, to bring it back to chip it. One thing too is like, we forget, like even within recent history, like geological history, like kind of you know how the universe, the, excuse me, the universe, how the Earth and the solar system still settling down. One of the, the biggest extinctions ever was like the Great Dying, which is like the Permian period, where there's the Siberian Traps, which is placed in Siberia where you look and there's vast, humongous volcanic fields. When they were active, you know, it's hundreds of millions of years ago, you would have looked at the Earth and you would have seen these big glowing bands, this big like glowing lake of volcanic liquid. Wow. And this is long after, this is billions of years after the moon had cooled down and most of the earth had cooled down, but it still shows you what's underneath the surface. And even then, you know, the, imagine the early solar system, there would have been a lot of that, a lot of that all over, you know. And so the idea that you'd have a collision and it would be like just molten rock spinning off into space and then still forming into something else like our moon is fascinating. Wow. That's crazy. That's, wow. that's just a... Uh, uh... I mean, it also, whenever we get into this level of thinking, it always just, I can't help but uh, uh, feel as insignificant as I've ever felt existentially <laughs> <laughs> to just to just know like what, like just embers of fragments of some uh, uh, context that is like epic and unknowable that we all are. And yet I'm like worried about whether or not somebody still remembers that I was a dick to them in middle school. Man. Yeah, it is crazy because you look at like, you know, when you watch sort of, you know, documentaries and they talk about, yeah, hey, this this was the what formed the Permian uh, uh, Triassic boundary. And for a couple million years, you had like literally like part of the earth had been ripped open, had been ripped yeah. open and just, you know, in such a scale, it's even hard to imagine. It obviously had a very dramatic impact on the rest of the planet. <laughs> but it's an interesting discovery because it's almost it. Reminds me of like the 
uh, of like Pangea, right? Like you can you can look at the kind of the continents and see how they kind of used to be shaped together a little bit. This is a little bit like that for our solar system. Just a little bit of, hey, these two things are actually kind of matching a little bit. So uh, everybody's up on Pangea, but what about Panthalassa? Pan, pan who now? Yeah, pan, wait, wait, what do you mean? Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar. I thought there was just one big old continent. You're telling me there was another one? No, no. If you have one big continent, what else do you have? A big a ocean. ocean. A big ocean? That's what they called the ocean back then. Panthalassa was the big, huge ocean. Ooh. It seems like something that uh, would be ordered for me uh, at an Indian restaurant that I would love. <laughs> yeah, you would. So that's kind of the crazy cool thing, too, is if you look up, if you look at the breakup of uh, Pangea, first when it's there, you, you look at a map like, hey, here's Boston, here's Beijing. You can walk from one to the other. You yeah, know, technically, just, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of amazing when you look at that. And then if you look at the, uh, you're like, yeah, here's, you know, Morocco and Boston and places like that are together. And then you can see, we're looking at a map of that. You can see that divide where the Atlantic Ocean starts to form. Once upon a time, the Atlantic Ocean was one inch wide. <laughs> wow. You know? Wow. Yeah, I mean, it almost, it, it, it almost looks like, and it runs a little mm, vaguely parallel to like the Amazon River where... Like there's a gulf there, but it's it's just it's nothing. It's not much. Wow. Yeah. So the Atlantic started well, all of a sudden one day it's a one inch apart. You know, a few years later it's a couple feet apart, and then over time, there's a whole ocean. And you can still like there's places where there's a number of places where the, the you can still see the seam. They have that famous divide, like in Greenland, you can swim between, but it's not the only place where it's you know you can you can walk across it but it's like kind of a i need thing people like to scuba dive down there and put their hands on either side of the plates and touch two continents wow that's yeah. wild and most of you know that's the thing too is that we 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 get focused on you know recent events and stuff and then you look at the geological history of our planet and how deep and how far back it goes we talk about, we think prehistoric, we think about dinosaurs, but there were ages, entire ages, you know, for hundreds of millions of years when there were no dinosaurs, you know, the creatures that came before, you know, and, you know, you had your age of, you know, just the sea creatures the living there and also think in land animals, there was large, like you had in the Permian, you had a lot of these land animals that were not yet dinosaurs. Yeah. All right, this is going to be kind of a visual thing, and I apologize for the audio listeners, but Bryce, you just played a GIF of Pangea splitting uh, right. uh, into into what we now understand as our as our globe. I would really love if we could just play the Transformers sound effect like while that that happened, just to watch <laughs> it's like like a break out into a pieces, and then I I mean if we could have a way for it to just reverse, I think it would be so amazing because you are you are dead right, Andrew, that there's just this like geologic, this ancient geologic history that if 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 uh, and I would recommend it now since obviously there's there's a lot of tension in the world, but if you ever wanna just like put things in perspective, then yeah, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, you can just understand that. Oh, also, we're a tick on the back of a gigantic rock transformer that is still in motion. And we've we've talked a bit about too about how since the you know we're in a current we're in what's called an interglacial period, which is a period basically between ice ages, but it's not like fully out of an ice age. And because there's still a lot of ice, we'll see. You know how long that ice lasts, but there's. Uh, if you go back to, let's say, within recorded history, just going back recorded history, how much water levels have changed, right? Forget the last couple hundred years or the last hundred years, last 50 years. Prior to that, how much water levels? And there's a fat, and I'm not saying there's a faster change now. That's not what we're talking about. But just historically, since going back to the times of the Egyptians, et cetera, you know, how much water levels have moved. There's places like in England, like there's island. There's an island that used to be a farm during Roman times. And you're like, where is the farm? It's a tiny island. Water levels were a bit lower then because there was, you know, a lot more water. It was still locked up in ice caps. And that's sort of an interesting thing to think about is like how much, like in the last couple thousand years, even our geography of things has changed. You look at people who are out there in the middle of like some of these islands in the South Pacific, you're like, how do they get there? Like, well, Go back and look at when their ancestors, you know, were traveling, 
water levels were lower, there was a lot more landmass out there. There were a lot more islands. There's a lot more opportunity to island hop. And then the water levels raise a bit. And now you're sealed off from everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So well, we well, see that impact now. I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, when you're not sealed off from everybody else is when you are subscribing to the Weird Things Patreon. Patreon.com slash Weird Things is where you go. Make sure you get your custom RSS feed. Make sure you get the After Things podcast that comes to you exclusively as fast as it possibly can. Thanks to that RSS feed. And we only mention it every once in a while. It, uh, it's always worth going over. When we say a custom RSS feed, this is something that you don't need a password for. You can put it in any podcast catcher, and these episodes will just come to you no matter what. In fact, if you uh, uh, decrease your, your pledge or leave, it'll just stop working automatically. And if you want to increase it, then, then uh, nothing changes at all. You don't ever have to download a new one. In it's fact, a, a great feature. It, it it doesn't just it doesn't stop working. It just means that you don't get after things early. You'll still get the episodes yeah. when they go public. So even then, it's a fully functioning feed, uh, even if you're a one-time subscriber. Patreon.com slash weird things. Check it out. Indeed. Now for fun, I want you all to do just an image search for uh Dimetrodon, which is D-I-M-E-T-R-O-D-O-N, Dime Trodon, Dimetrodon. Okay. I'm and just here. look at the images. Sure, here we go. Oh, this is the scaly boy. He's got a he's got a big fin on the back. See that scaly boy? <laughs> when, when you see that, you're like like dinosaur, right? Yeah. No, wrong, false. What? What? That's not, what? A, not a dinosaur. That's a dinosaur. No, actually, Andrea, I actually think you know I hate to do this, but I think this is a correction. I think this is a dinosaur because I've seen this in the dinosaur. I books. think yeah. Well, because number one, uh, uh, when you get the dinosaur pack of toys. Right. There is like a very standard uh, uh, variation. You're going to get your T-Rex. You're going to get your Brontosaurus. You're going to get your Pterodactyl. And and then you're going to get one of these Dimetrodons, which has the big uh, fin on the back. If you got a really good one, you might get an Ankylosaurus as well. But uh, you're telling me that we've been sold, again, another bill of goods here. This thing isn't even a dinosaur. What is it? Well, you're confusing your Spinosaurus for your Dimetrodon. Oh, you see species, not everybody with the ridge of like fin like spines along their back is a dinosaur. So then what the hot ham water is a dimetrodon? Yeah, I mean, I dimetrodon guess it, is it looks like a it looks like a lizard, like a like a uh, it looks like if an iguana had a T-Rex's head. OK, so uh, it is a synapsid, OK? So synapsids is that what split off and basically things that are that were related to the mammals. So we are more closely related to that than like a dinosaur would be. That's part of the group that split off and formed the mammals. So that is an extant synapsid, not quite an extant mammal, not quite a mammal, but it is of the same family that we're from. Versus the dinosaurs, which came from the visually, it was a reptile offshoot. You go back far enough, it's like all reptiles, but then the reptiles also split off and then became what became dinosaurs and birds. But as an example of showing, like often we think of like prehistoric stuff, we just think, oh, you know, dinosaurs and saber toothed tigers and maybe some sloths. But it's like this would have been from, I believe this is, would have been like a Permian area creature, just showing like there were just a lot of animals. And, you know, the world was filled for hundreds of millions of years with creatures before dinosaurs. There was an age before them. Wow. Uh, wow. So these are, this is a dinosaur prequel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like mammal prequel. A mammal prequel. Holy yeah. crap. And I didn't know this lived during the Sizzlerian phase. <laughs> Sizzlerian, ah. Sizzlerian phase. Ah, yeah. So, so it just, it just, I, I love like if you want to do something cool, go do like a deep dive in some of those documentaries that are just about the things before the dinosaurs hmm. and just give you that sense of deep history, which we're still trying to figure out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, the, the, the more the older I've gotten, and the more I've I've actually uh, tried to piece together my own view of the world. The one thing that I know more and more is how how paltry our understanding of the world is, and that is that is the beautiful thing about it. The beautiful thing about it is that it's like we are a few discoveries and advancements in in technology away from just always understanding more and more. So one of the things, too, you can look for to sort of spot the difference. If you go back to that image from or look at the Google images of the Dimetrodon, count the toes. Count the toes. Oh, OK. So okay. 
Like the Dimitri, it looks like he's got five toes. Five toes. That, and that would, oh, cause I mean, we have five. Now look at your hand. Now look at your hand. <laughs> oh no, I want Dimitri it on. Ah, oh my God. That's Sorry, amazing. God. That's I clever. Think, so in the images, there's one where they showed a scale of Dimitridon, and then they have like somebody put like a sexy woman clip art, you know, <laughs> like like something oh. off of a truck flap. <laughs> yeah, to I guess to to compare the size. <laughs> oh, oh, so the ridge goes about as high as a a, a, a random bot on Tinder. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, anyhow. Oh, that's on DeviantArt too. Oh, I'm not gonna click on that. Oh, that's that's who knows what that's gonna be actually. Hmm. Cool. Demetrodon. Yeah. So dinosaurs are cool. So are all the other creatures that we call dinosaurs, but weren't dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah. It is a broad genre. You know, a lot. A lot of things probably. A lot of mislabeled things tend to fall into that in our broad cultural sense. Yeah. Um, like we'd say pterosaur, but they weren't really dinosaurs. They were just flying reptiles. So. Yeah. Oh boy, this is a show we should really just have a kindergartner on here to correct us. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, everybody who's just learning this for the first time, and they're like, "No, no, you're wrong." I, I mean, there's science has changed enough since I've been in school, where I'll see like TikToks of like, can where it makes me feel like the number of continents and the number of oceans has changed. I know that the planets changed at one point. And then it kind of reverted, right? And so Neptune is still a planet. But then I, I, I think they re, did they reclassify the continents or something in the past uh, t- 15 years? Uh, no one is quite sure. They, but yeah, I, I know there's, yeah, I think they, they sort of look at plates and try to figure that stuff up. So um, yeah, so many comments says they say some dinosaurs may have had feathers. Now that's weird. Yeah, that's, that's like if you watch new nature shows about dinosaurs, like, like if you don't put feathers on some of them, you know you'll get letters because it seems very likely that many of them had them. Well, right, because you know? we believe a lot of uh, birds today descended from dinosaurs. Is that right? They, they're yeah, they're an offshoot species of that. So they were. I mean, as somebody with birds, I I can see it. I can see it. The way that the way that they stalk around and and uh, it is it is very very T Rex esque. Yeah, that was one of the things too. Is like there was an age, you know, we had giant insects. You had like centipedes that were like ten feet long. Mm-mm. Okay, Good God. you had uh, not me. Yeah, you had uh, dragonflies with like two foot wingspans. And that was mostly uh, uh, oxygen, right? Like it was like well, a more oxygen rich environment. That there, so when they went back and they looked at the fossil record, when oxygen levels went down, the centipedes went away, but you still had the dragonflies. And huh. the dragonflies, they think that was probably like the movement of their wings was able to keep moving air through there. There's this weird way, like, like uh, when you scale up like a an, a, an insect, like or you scale up something like something like a, a a dragonfly, you'll see. There are these tubes, these air tubes actually scale disproportionately. So there's sort of an upper limit to size. But basically, they were all around even long after oxygen levels went close to where they are today. And the thing that probably got them was probably a couple factors. It may even have to deal with some kind of plants as far as like kind of the food that was available where dragonflies hatched underwater. And then the other factor is, well, flying reptiles and birds. <laughs> you know? Yeah. They're like, Look at these big, juicy, juicy morsels we can eat. So that may have had a big impact was probably like when reptiles and birds, when reptiles learned to fly, then you had birds. That was probably the end of giant dragonflies. That was a wrap. Yeah. All of a sudden they weren't quite as high on the food chain as they were uh, before the new additions. Yeah. Smaller was better. (laughs) Uh, Another topic here is this is kind of interesting. This is, this is, uh, this is relating to, Okay, do you, do you want to do, there's a, a article came out and it talked about sort of bringing up the point that, and this is another history example, um, we we're still wrestling with like, why did Neanderthals go extinct 40,000 years ago, right? Uh-huh. And Dr. Nicholas, Nicholas Longrich, a senior lecturer in evolutionary biology and paleontology at the University of Bath, has an article in the conversation 
And basically, he's like, uh, we were at war with them for like 100,000 years. He's like, it was probably humans versus Neanderthals. You know, we we have this sort of romanticized idea that we infrequently, you know, met with each other. We can see their DNA in our DNA, and we can know, like, the romantic entanglements. But he's like, no, like, these, we find evidence in both groups of a lot of conflict, blunt instrument hitting, fighting, etc. We were probably fighting with Neanderthals for 100,000 years. 100,000 years? They lost. That, that, that's... Kind of like the space story. That is too big for me to wrap my mind around. I mean, that's generations. That's 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 generations of generations of of Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens. Just, I mean, I guess we think of I mean, war that, now not, as like that's not even a conflict. That's life. Yeah, that's, that's a societal structure. Happens. That's yeah. So he's got a pretty interesting article talking about like sort of like what would have been like Neanderthal territories and sort of the points at which humans may have tried to incur and just sort of pushed back. That may have been what kept us in Africa for the longest time was just the Neanderthals keeping us from, you know, going into there. And finally, the Neanderthals would have been a formidable fighter. Uh, they were, you know, thicker bones, you know, bigger skulls. They would have been harder to take down. And it may have been ultimately our ability to cooperate with other tribes, other groups of you know Homo sapiens, the weapons we're able to build, et cetera, that eventually gave us the upper hand. And and it might be, it could be an example of you know why we became the dominant species was because we had to develop, we couldn't rely on evolution alone to let us, you know, fight them. We had to rely upon basically you know cooperation to do this. And it is sort of an interesting tell. You think about this as like. They were the indigenous species in Europe and Asia. They were. They were there before us. Yet as we left Africa, we're like, hey, uh, some nice land you got there. We'd like to be there too. <laughs> and by the way, we're willing to wait for it. Like uh, at least six figures in terms of years that we're going to spend fighting. And this map, I yeah. mean, this map is a, is brutal. I don't know if this is, is this the only, but this is a, a Homo sapien first uh uh, offensive uh, from South Africa across what would be Asia, Eurasia, even maybe India. Wow. But yeah, you have in parts of Asia, they have the Tennisovans, which is another a group that now is getting more attention lately, which was related to Neanderthals, but not the Neanderthals. You know, they were a different group unto themselves and we're finding more about them and where they lived. And so it is just this map shows you you know, modern Homo sapiens, archaic Homo sapiens in Africa, and then Neanderthal territories and its oven lands, like it's this map of Middle Earth. That's crazy. Yeah. Kind of the, the idea that we spent, you know, 100,000 years in a state of war with, you know, another species. I mean, that it really does bring kind of even context to those, like that way of our, our, our thinking, like the idea of a, a prehistory uh, world of like you know races that are just at war, right? Like that that if we're just like, oh no, yeah, like they were uh, uh, elves and we were dwarves, and we're just that we just hate each other and we fight each other forever. Yep, yep. And then we kind of the, the amount of cooperation we actually have today is amazing. It is just you're not going to find that anywhere else in the animal kingdom, anywhere else else in history, and we have conflicts that we need to have less of but that is sort of i think the hopeful sort of note is that you know it used to be a long time ago two unrelated primates met they would fight yeah now you know it's not now we case. live yeah yeah we, we we have we have an incentive to cooperate to succeed to thrive and to uh that we can uh, be, be be better for trading or at least not killing at the very yeah, exactly. least not killing yeah we're just yeah. like everything else. Look, it's a rich uh, path that you can follow. Otherwise, we're just going to go ahead and set the baseline. And please don't immediately kill each other. Yeah. So another, this is totally unrelated to anything, but I thought I'd bring this up. Just sort of one small story here. Some Stanford researchers have done something interesting where they've put people into VR setups, headsets, you know, and hand trackers measured their data, and they used a pool of 511 participants, 
And they say with less than five minutes of tracking data per person, they can spot who is who. Oh, like a movement fingerprint, just the way that you idle when you're... Yep. Wow. They gave a, They had them use Vibes and Vibe One controllers, and they each watched like five 20-second clips from a randomized 360-degree uh, video that answered questions, and they said from watching them, they were able to tell who was who. You know, I... I wonder whether or not that's part of what we'll just see beyond VR if like, you know, in, in a world of biometrics where we're, you know, wondering like, okay, well, is it better to face unlock or fingerprint unlock if, if our next, you know, uh, phase over the next five or 10 years of like ring doorbells will be like, oh no, we know it's you walking up. Like we mm -hmm. have enough uh, data of of just like the the way you move nobody else moves exactly like you move and and that is that that is a way that we can just unlock your door no matter what or maybe like that's yeah. because they have a similar thing for um captcha right where on some of them you know where you just check the box and you don't uh sometimes you don't have to do the test you know the the, the squares test whatever they base that based on your pointer movement and as long as you don't have a uh automated bot like you know behavior with your cursor on that page uh in in some instances right there's still they they still verify a lot of times with the image test but they'll just say oh yeah that's kind of how a human would have scrolled on this page or or will act so we'll just verify you because that's all it is it's, very, it's not necessarily uh, uh all about the learning image learning stuff it's it's about verifying what who who is and isn't human yeah Gentlemen, one of your picks. Sure. Yeah. Um, I watched the, the Netflix series The Queen's Gambit. Uh, it is, I think, seven episodes. Got to the end of it last night. And I uh, very much enjoyed it. I thought uh, uh, the the writing was was really, really good. Uh, what What I'm kind of surprised about, I haven't read a lot of critical reaction to it, but uh, it very much felt to me like a biopic movie from the, like, aughts. Uh, now, this is a fictitious character. It's not a real person, at least to my knowledge. Maybe a composite of a lot of different similar types of people. But uh, it, it follows some of those same kind of, like, stations of the cross of, like, how the great person became the great person uh, but dialed up to 11 because it's a fictitious story and you don't have to worry about, um, you know, uh, trampling on the truth. But man, did I, did I really like it? And and did I really kind of miss while, while I was watching it? I'm like, oh, this is kind of like Walk the Line or Ray or, or something like that. Like down to some of the, like, some of the, 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 the tropier sort of elements of it. But I really liked it. And I, I really like the fact that, like, you know, you, you have a, a movie like Walk Hard, which parodied that. Uh, uh, and I love that movie. It's one of my favorite uh, of comedies of its era. But, like, there's a reason why all these movies won Oscars and, and we like them. And I would, uh, I would, I, more, more fictitious biopic movies. I liked it. Yeah, I uh, I I am um, I only got through six of the seven episodes by today, but I I also really enjoyed the Queen's Gambit. I think about halfway through the 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 thing that kind of threw me is I think you're right, Justin, in that this is very much framed like a biopic. One of the tough things about this is I, I don't know a lot about chess. Hey, I don't know a lot about chess, and they do you you can tell that they do a lot to impart. Uh, emotionally what is happening in these matches right a lot yeah. of faces a lot of camera movements and music and, and a lot of direction to tell you how the the course of these these big chess matches are going and it feels that that has felt unfortunate that is that has made it feel a little a little genericized almost because i i i'm 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 getting a little Bit, all right like I, i'm understanding a little bit more of like you know there are there are tactics at play there are stratagems yeah like why is why is she good 
uh, why is she so much better than everybody else? Aside from from like, you know, is she just the most supernatural tic tac toe player, or is there some element to her game? that we are supposed to understand separates her. I do think they get a little bit more to it. And I think there's also some very clever things that they do specifically in terms of jumping ahead where it's like, they're building up like tension, 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 tension. And now we're five hours afterward. Like, and now we're, we're, you know, at the bar uh, uh, where, where they're, where they're discussing things. And I think that that's, uh, that is, that is smart because there's only so much, Chess is only so visually interesting, even if you're uh, expertly kind of set dressing and and putting it in an interesting period in time. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, that that's kind of a um, between that and some of the these later episodes feel maybe a little a little um, loose, maybe feel a little a little padded a little bit. Um, but I also think that the story the story is good, and I think it's it's really cool the the setups that they do in the situation, kind of setting it in the Cold War and um, having it be almost a sort of international affair. Um, but it also just feels a, a little too long. Like it's too long. It would have been too long to be a feature length movie. Yeah, you are. Yeah, uh, you are. You are. You might be at a valley as things begin to pick up because if I'm those, on the same, if those I, are your, I have one last episode. You, oh, you have one last. Okay, no, then yeah. Yeah. Then you are pretty much at like, you are you are at the point where you know everything is going to uh, uh, wrap itself up. But, yeah. uh, but, um, but I think it's great. I, I think it is managed to be an easy watch for you know. I don't know a lot about chess, but they do a good job of telling me if I'm supposed to feel feel tense or feel feel what. And and uh, I think her own uh, 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 her own issues dealing with uh, substances and and drinking. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is which is really ultimately all the biopics for which I just compared it to are they're not really about musicians. They're about people dealing with family and substance abuse. And this is a, another story about dealing with family and substance abuse. And and it uh, and again, because they can make up the story and it doesn't have to. You're not maligning somebody living or dead mm -hmm. uh, by telling the most interesting version of it. They can make it like. 11 out of 11 in terms of uh how how crazy things are or, or how, how crazy things got but uh but yeah you know uh, i i i thought it was it's amazing also what you can make on a netflix budget like you know and, and or even like you know uh we i'm sure you guys talked about the mandalorian coming back but like it's amazing what visually you can put on screen like stuff that that I mean, not even that would be like, oh my god, this is a a great movie, like uh, special effects uh, and and cinematography. Not but a year ago, two years ago, it's like, like the gap between those two things has almost totally closed. Yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm gonna double down on your pick in the Queen's Gambit because uh, that's really been what I spent the past weekend uh kind of hammering through I, I think it's i think it's a good watch i think it's a good watch and it's not that long it's it's seven hour long episodes and uh they call yeah, they're look, calling if it you're, a, if, you're, if you're not into it by the first two episodes then yeah then then just just knock it off there but i think you're you, you're probably gonna sail through yeah and um uh it, yeah it's good the queen's gambit is on netflix uh andrew have you got a pick Yes. So my pick actually is going to be inspired by somebody asked a question in the chat section, which I can't speak to that, but they wanted to know there's a, there's a scene where she plays an entire chess club, right? Uh, in chess. And somebody said, Hey, is this how, you know, how did, did Darren Brown do it the way that he did it? I don't remember when Darren Brown did it, but that is a classic. There's a magic sort of cod where you yeah. play 12 people at chess at once. And so my pick is going to be the first time I heard about that was in a book by Harry Anderson called Games You Can't Lose, A Guide for Suckers. Uh, the late Harry Anderson was a wonderfully entertaining magician, comedian, actor, etc. Also, his writing was great. He wrote this with Turk Pipkin. So in there, if I'm not mistaken, he actually describes, you know, how to, how to, how to play an entire chess club and win, which is sort of like kind of an old sort of gag or con and what you can do. And I think it's, it's just a, a neat book. There's a couple different versions of the book out there. But uh, 
if you're interested for something, yeah, the Night Court dude, that was him. He used to appear on Cheers as Harry the Hat, and they loved that character so much they created the show Night Court around Harry Anderson. Wow, I didn't, so. I, I had never seen Night Court, but I did not realize that. Wow. Yeah. So that'll explain how you do that, which yeah. somebody just described in the chat. So. Uh, yeah. And, and 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 Darren Brown describes it in in the the the, the special that he does. So okay, yeah, cool. So yeah, then yeah. then we get it. The, the point is, is you you basically play the players against each other. You just you know whatever one person does, you play that move against the next player, and you keep going around and around and around mm. doing that. Uh, which I think the was old, an old scam school all, episode. I, I believe that was an old scam school episode that that Brian had covered years, many years back. Yeah. Oh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't doubt it. But that's not how she won in the Queen's Gambit. No, no, no. no. She they was specifically are like, genius. she starts uh, on all of them. Yeah. 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 And I'll just, all this is my pick. Like, I, I enjoyed the Queen's Gambit, really liked it. I uh, thought she was great, liked the story. I like the idea of let's create, you know, what if there had been uh, a female chess prodigy back then, you know, and sort of tell a narrative about that, which I thought was great. My only, my only really kind of note on it was, and they tried to deal with it a little bit. She would have been a far bigger deal. It would have been a far bigger deal to have one a chess champion in the '60s who was going to be able to an American chess champion who has kind of chance of beating the Russians. Um, one of the things that would happen, like if you follow like you know the Bobby Fischer story and all this sort of stuff, the government would have made sure you had money to get to where you needed to go. Yes. And yeah. if it had been a woman, that would have been even bigger. There would have been there would have been news crews and stuff outside of her house a lot. Yeah, you know, there there are moments where they think they flirt around with uh, putting that into context of of saying like, oh, she has to go to the Tonight Show or whatever. That's like part of her swing. But I think you're right. There there, there should have been uh, a a bigger swell of uh, uh, fame that that would have enveloped her. And they, you know, without getting into spoilers, they they do kind of show a trajectory of that by the end of the story, but I, I agree. I think that she wouldn't have been able to hide even in Kentucky. Yeah, I think, I think that, and they could have done, kind of made the point even more of what they were doing about like being a woman and what she had to deal with and all that. And the fact that they, they touch upon this a little bit as she's, you know, in Life Magazine and stuff. And it's like telling her to smile and it'd be pretty and stuff. And she just can't just be herself. Yeah, and and I think that would have been a neat opportunity to. See. And I'm curious to see in the book, uh, by Tevis, like how much more if that was explored or whatever. You know what, why they did or didn't do that. But anyhow, I really enjoyed it. Everybody I know enjoyed it. If you don't like it, then um, go back to your Connect Four. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's been weird. Nice. Uh, it's always good that they do the chess prodigy stuff before they go crazy. You know, they did, they ended it right at the perfect time. She's at the peak of her powers. She wins. And uh, oh. uh, there we go. Oh, Oops, okay. spoiler. Oops. Well, I figured it was probably going to end that way anyway. Uh, cool. Well, that's weird things, everybody. We're going to do a little bit of after things here before uh, before we head off for happy hour. Uh, but we're gonna take a, a few uh, uh, moments here and take it take a, a brief break. Um, yeah. Here it goes. Yeah, I need a couple minutes just to answer some stuff, and then I'll. Sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I completely understand that. We're apparently some network stuff uh, came up. Turns out, eh, turns out. We'll stay, we'll stay online with you. Yeah, I. I yeah. I I did really enjoy Queen's Game. I was I was gonna try to finish it up before Cord Killers and um talk about it on that show here in a few hours. Um, yeah, it's really solid. And then uh, coming up on Cord Killers, uh, so it's just uh, gonna be Brian and Tom this week on Cord Killers. Uh, and I'll be in there. I'll I'll be in the mix. Yeah. But uh, uh, on Spoiler in Time this week, our our Spoiler Talk review show. Uh, we are covering the finale, finally, of the Larry Sanders show. Oh wow! Yeah. And then next week we we'll be getting we we'll be getting we will be beginning a new uh, library show in that slot with Hannibal, 
which I think is going to be interesting. Oh, cool. Yeah. Man, uh, I'll tell you, what, that final episode of the Larry Sanders show, the uh the 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 Jim Carrey performance. It's just great. Out of this world. Mwah. Out it's of this perfect. world. Hard Everybody. to imagine, hard to imagine, or put into context now, what a supernova um, Jim Carrey was at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Ace Ventura, Mask, Dumb and Dumber, like that run from In Living Color, which was like, oh, this is like the new vein of sketch comedy. Fox was this exciting new network, like... Uh, and then he just becomes this singular sort of comedic uh, a voice in a way that, like, even though we've seen the, like, comedy superstar that comes along, we've like, we've seen Will Ferrell, we've seen... Eddie Murphy. Uh, yeah, well, Ed, Murphy was before. Murphy was, right. was, was pre... Um, but Murphy was cool, and Ferrell was an everyman, and... Jim Carrey was just a big like from Mars. He yeah. was just like this spastic, like insane tornado in a way that was like, you know, just just something uh, otherworldly. But it's so crazy to look at that in, in the context of the Larry Sanders show where they're doing a fictional version of it, uh, of, of him. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's like him heightening to a fictional level is like, oh, no, like. This is just like he would a hundred percent do this on a on a show at at that point in time. Like it just so happens that this is f- like fake. I you know I'm trying to think like I guess Louis C.K. probably would have been the last like big comedian superstar. Maybe John Mulaney is kind of in that space, but I feel like he hasn't had crossover. No, no, because because no, you have to do movies, right? That's, or at least, and maybe we're, we, we need to re reframe or redraw the lines of like what it takes to be the kind of comedy king. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, what, what separates Jim Carrey, uh, Eddie Murphy, Kevin Hart, Kevin Hart, Kevin Hart, Kevin Hart, Kevin Hart, sure. Hart Adam oh, yeah, Sandler. Absolutely. Yeah, Kevin Hart, I think would would certainly be in there. Um, oh, um, Sandler, oddly enough, has I don't know if he ever hit the peak of a Feral or a a, a Carry. No, but, but I feel like he hooked into a something much in his career. Been, yeah, he's hooked into something and is coasting pretty comfortably. Like he's like like that's like comedy McDonald's. Like you might yes. not. Like at some point you had a McDonald's <laughs> meal you really liked, whether or not you think it's healthy or good now. And and there's like there's likely at some point you're gonna have a McDonald's meal and you're gonna be happy about it. But like he's just I mean that new them, that new Halloween them out. the Halloween movie he did uh this year, like I don't I don't love it. I didn't finish it, but I know a lot of people in my kind of hoitier toitier comedy circles dug it. They were like into it. Um, yeah. And it's like, that's not the first, like, oh, like, kind of like solid movie he's had since all this Netflix stuff a few years back. Um, oh, yeah. He's a fascinating guy, uh, a fascinating uh, uh, a study in like where Hollywood is too, because uh, all he does is like make broadly popular things that are undeniably successful (laughs) it's like it's it is it is really amazing that he can continue to to rock and roll with that yeah i mean he's not done anything like the critics have loved or raved about and called one of the best movies of the year since uncut gems oh i mean yeah sure and he's got he's got that he's got that uh that 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 thing to him although i i I blurted out Kevin Hart because he's a guy that had been around forever, but then blew up yeah. really in the last few years in a big way. You know, he just went like critical mass in like the last decade, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, he, he really took that stand up boom from, you know, the, the one, you know, from the aughts that really started, uh, you know, past like, Dice was playing 
arenas in like the 80s and the 90s certainly if uh you know you had other comedians if they wanted to pursue that they could have like Seinfeld or Murphy or, or or whatever but like Kevin Hart was was the one who took it to football stadiums mm. like which is insane I can't imagine watching a stand-up in a football stadium I guess That's just crazy I guess on that level you know then I think it would be it would have been Dane Cook previously I mean if we're if we're talking on that level of a movie star major live performer He just, he never had, uh, he never had like the big movie thing. So that was the problem. He just never quite. Yeah. Wait, sorry, who like, is this? Dane, Dane, Dane Cook. Cook. He had a, he did have oh, some movies, never, but yeah, he never yeah, had a he, major breakout. Yeah. Yeah, that was, he, he tried. They, they, Hollywood, Hollywood gave him a, a, a shot. You know, the problem was, is that like his kind of comedy was always very cool, which I think was a differentiator for his audience for stand up. But when you go to Hollywood, boy, is that rich in other cool guys. Like you're going to be sub Ryan Reynolds if you are, unless you are like a transcendent on screen presence. All right. Give me, give me, give me one second because I got to turn the. Uh... Changing this computer over to a different network. Stop streaming. Okay. You guys have a topic we want to talk about? Um. Uh. Not on the top of my head. Let me see if we got an email about it. And I think. Uh, yeah. Hello to the people watching live. I think we're back. Hello. Hello. Um. No, I'm not seeing that we got an email. Um, what should we talk about? Uh, have you been? Have you kept up using Notion? I I oh, downloaded it. I, I have. I, I have. would like to know more about how you guys are yeah. using it because I downloaded after you talked about it, Andrew, a couple of weeks back, and I haven't used it. But I did like using it. I haven't figured out the a way to integrate it or to use it for 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 other things. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be happy to talk about it. I've, I've actually, uh, I've, I've uh, become quite smitten with it for, for pretty specific reasons. Oh, okay. We'll, uh, we'll do a little productivity tool talk. Cool. Yeah. All right, give me, give me just another 30 seconds here. I won't be able to. Oh, I guess I can pull up one. I can pull this up and keep my mind on it. Cool. All right, you guys. Uh, you guys wanna do? Want to do the do? Ooh, ah! Let's do it. How many fingers Let's does do it have? It. How many fingers does it have? <laughs> All I know is I thought I could get my hand up in there and then it gets stuck. Oh, oh no! Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> oh, no. All right, let's get us started with after things in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hello, friends. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Gentlemen, a while ago we talked about, I, I had a pick which was Notion which I think if you go to like what notion.so is the mm -hmm. website for it. That's it. And it's a kind of a productivity team management tool. It allows you to do a lot of different things, which sometimes is a danger because it makes it hard to define. But once you dig in to start using it, it can be extremely powerful. And I've used it to make all kinds of notes, to create stuff, to keep track of projects, et cetera. And Bryce said uh, it, it was the worst thing ever. No. It was, um, <laughs> yeah. The I worst like... thing since devs. <laughs> that was Bryce's. Uh, not since devs have I been so disgusted and personally insulted. I like Notion. I, I da so you recommended Notion on I mean, maybe Weird Things or After Things a few weeks back. And I downloaded it. I know Brian downloaded it at that time. It sounds like Justin downloaded it then. I only used it for a... For a 
that day. I you, I messed with it a Thanks little bit. Things I day. hate about death. <laughs> Uh, but it was very cool. It was very easy to set up, you know, like, okay, here's a project. Here's a start page of a project. You can link stuff. You can make stuff. You can make tables and graphs and all sorts of stuff. You can make, you know, to-do lists, kind of like um, uh, a Trello sort of thing. You can make, like, it, it, there. there's a lot of stuff in here, which I think was a little tough for me because we have specific things that I use every week for various things. But... I don't know. How have you guys been using Notion? Because it seems really uh, cool. I immediately found a great use for it. And that is something that I've been looking for for a long time. Show sheets. So we do podcasts. Every podcast is an episode. Very often the podcasts that we're uh, producing require topics to go over. Uh, what are the biggest pain points in keeping topics? Number one, you think of a thought that's like, oh, that'd be great for this show. And then you forget it, right? Uh, uh, so you need an easy way to catch them. Number two, the, the biggest thing that I've seen, um, you know, it, it used by other podcasting professionals to keep show sheets is either you're doing a document in Google Docs or you're doing a, a spreadsheet in Google Sheets. Both of which I've always found awkward. The, the, the document is, you know, dependent on a lot of just very weird formatting. Uh, and it always just feels odd to just have it on a piece of paper. Uh, the sheet is something that I've, I've also always found super awkward because you're using it for a thing. It's not intended to, you're shoving a bunch of words into the, the formatting. That's kind of weird. It's hard to follow sometimes when you're reading a script notion is has been perfect not only is it a great place for me to catch all the stories so politically i'm i'm you know i'm always building a show sheet for politics 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 i make four separate things on sunday and then as i am finding things uh they have great visual bookmarks i can go right into it either on my phone or on the desktop i do slash w and it just says web bookmark uh, i just enter in the url that i found I can now keep all that information in there. My Thursday, uh, or sorry, my Friday sheet, I just have a little separate thing for the mailbag. And uh, I can now copy my mailbag stuff into there as I go along. So I'm not just having to do it on one day. Uh, it's been awesome. And uh, uh, down to the fact that both, uh, I can keep a, I can keep, my my show sheet on here where uh, uh, I can have a check marks on like what my workflow is for each episode. Did I record the episode? Did I review the episode? Did I publish the episode to all the places where I need to publish it? And either I can print it out on a thing that looks really cool uh, uh, or I can uh, just have it be all digital and I can keep it uh, uh, in front of me like that. I've I've just really 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 enjoyed Notion. I can't say enough about it. I've been using it to organize uh, some stuff in uh, my other job to sort of help organize and explain like tutorials, things like this. Because you can create a page and it, it's very easy to create a page like an information page and to link to stuff and then make it public and share it and say, hey, here's the link to this thing where you can do this. It is. It is, it, it suffers from, it does so many things so well, it's hard to define what particular thing it's for, but it's not, but it's a reason to sort of explore and play around with it. You know, my one thing, I think, I know this is a thing they're considering and, and it, it, that is, it would be wonderful to create like very easy direct URLs for public web pages to be able to like build a website out of Notion. Cause I would love, love, love to just have like a simple URL point to a site that's like a Notion site. Cause, yeah. um, you know, it's just such an easier way to do stuff. And you can tell you have to stop every now and then and think, how would you do things with the tools you have today? And Notion feels very much like people who stopped and looked around maybe five years ago and say, what, what, what's a, and not to say that that's makes, it makes for a contemporary tool now to say, how would you do things now? You know, how would you make it very easy to create stuff? You want to add an image, it's got like Unsplash integrated into it, which you just pull up an image library and boom, there's an image. 
You're not copying, pasting URLs unless you have something else you want to use. There's so many things that are so simple. It's a lot like WordPress in many ways when you go to create a post or create something. Very, very, very well thought out. And it takes a little time to get through the sort of the understanding of what it can and can't do. Like I remember struggling with like, well, is this a public page or is this private? How do I share this? How does this work? Automatically creating, like you start a document, it'll create a headline for that document on the page you link to it from. It's if you're a person that deals with an idea, deals with ideas, I think Notion is a wonderful tool, a wonderful, wonderful tool because you can brainstorm and also surface things and make things public with it. Yeah, the, the the pain point that I found in sharing uh, documents, it, and I don't think that this is necessarily a notion problem as much as it is just uh, uh, entering into the marketplace. It has frightened and confused some people that I have sent <laughs> URLs to, and I think that they feel that there's an expectation that they need to download something or, um, you know, I... Uh, that's that's really been the only thing is like it's not as easy as sharing a Google Doc, at least culturally. It might technically be the exact same. Culturally, people, I think, have have been like, oh, I don't know what this is and, and haven't gotten around to reading it. Yeah. And that's nice thing. You can just export it as a PDF if they don't need to edit it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really, really, really clean export functions in there. Totally. Totally. No, I've I've. Man, I, I, I really can't say enough about how much, as soon as I started screwing around with it as a show sheet, I was like, oh my God, is this the, 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 the sheets meets docs? Because uh, uh, it looks pretty. And there's just yeah. one of those things where it's like, I know that for some people it doesn't matter. For me, when it's, it's, it's the tool for which I use every day. The fact that I have my own little header, it's got my album art uh, up, up top. It's got a little American flag there, like, or an eagle I have for my show sheet. It just looks like a cool thing. And, and if I'm sharing a show sheet with somebody, it's like, oh, wow, I look like I have my crap together because I kind of do thanks to this tool. Yeah, I, I think it works well the, on mobile, too. The, the one of the really strong things is is the linking capabilities where you can just link mm -hmm link pages link link oh, data yeah. together like with with you know docs or sheets you know you it's they're fine processors but you can't really connect them to anything or like like for cord killers for cord killers every week we have a doc that the guys have been using since the past six years or so and every week we add a new sheet and we we copy the template and all but uh, that just it makes it load really. It takes it's it takes a really long time to load. It's like not a good way to do that. At where I feel like if we had it in Notion, there are probably automation things that we could do and just nice stuff to to make it feel like it can can hyperlink around to each other. Oh well, you know, and we touched on this story this week's ago, and you click in, and go back, or something like that. Because I I think that's that's the thing that's missing with with the free processors is is. A real sense, like, like with Notion, the little bit that I used it, it seemed like it really seemed like, hey, if you wanted to go and change a thing, or just, just you can just touch it and do it, you know. If you if you need this to be a, a to do sheet, here's a to do list, and then here's a, make a table out of it, make a database out of that, make you know, switch the type of pages, like really easy. Um, and there's there's something there's, fluid about that workflow. Yeah, there's it's if you go back. 40 years, you know, to win. And and the idea of kind of the, the, the root sort of idea behind hypertext almost goes back all to the early stages of information theory of from a time when things were so linear, the idea of being able to link around and move to it was an exciting, one of the exciting things about computers was that, you know, you could have a book could just be a bunch of blocks that you could index across and go across there and go laterally. And we take that for granted, but also to the point though, that we sometimes forget why that could be useful. And the problem with docs is that they're trying to recreate the word processor, the, the sheet, which is trying to recreate the written page, you know, and we've, we've taken over a lot of that. It's like, you know, the point that was, I never even thought about somebody pointed out was like, yeah, Google docs, it still has page breaks. It's still broken up into pages. Yeah. And, and I mean, not you that can, you shouldn't have that option. Yeah. But, 
I mean, you can you can collapse you, know, you can collapse that, or I think you can make it invisible, but it's not the def it's not the default way to look at it for sure. Well, it's still yeah. I mean, it, the idea that perhaps that you know we need to move into a modality where we think about things in a different way, but and it's still it you put links in there like you do into text, like it's like it, like it wants its final form to be something you're going to pre print out. It sure. doesn't look at its final form as an electronic document. And that's sort of, I think, sort of the handicaps of it. It's very useful, extremely useful, but still it's limited. And that's what's kind of exciting about Notion is it's like, no, we think it's final form is an electronic document. And one of the reasons why, you know, we still would print so much paper is that like, yeah, because we're building, we're building fancy typewriters that were designed to output pieces of paper when reality, where you want to go, is something that takes the best of both worlds. So it's neat to sort of see that, you know, where people are sort of, you know, thinking about it in a different way. Uh, here's another thing that I've loved with it is that there's one project I'm working on that is, uh, you know, a lot of script revisions, uh, for a podcast and historically I've just had a doc and sometimes I just copy and paste when I, when I, I know I'm going to keep 80% of it, but either I got to reorder it or I got to reframe it, blah, 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 blah. I would just copy that gigantic block of text and then you know, return, 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 maybe space, 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 like version two, paste it, uh, redo everything. The fact that I can link within all these uh, uh, different things and I can just go uh, down to my latest revision or I can just click through, like here's a 101.1, a 101.2, a 101.3, uh, know that they correspond to the podcasts that were the, the versions of the podcast that I've already produced that I have the audio for, man, it's just, it's rad. Yeah. Man, there was a, a tangent I wanted to go on and I can't remember what it was, but just the point of like stopping and sort of rethinking our tools and sort of saying, knowing what we know now, yeah. how would you do it? And, and mm -hmm. often we get so much momentum that we don't do that. And cause you can't do it all the time because it's not efficient, but there are certain points in time where you should go, Hey, we've learned a lot more now. How would you do this? And the danger is sometimes trying to like, well, I'm going to reinvent the future. Like, I, an example I'd give was like when Apple redid Final Cut, they took some stuff they learned from iMovie that tried to make iMovie easier. And with Final Cut, they're like, we wanted to kind of do that with file management, but also the way that you use Final Cut. And they did this radical change with Final Cut 10. And it went basically stopped being used a lot. It was on this really good trajectory within the industry for being used a lot. I worked on productions that would use Final Cut. And then when they did that changeover, people It was like overnight, and, yeah. Yeah, and then the, just the shift was like, I don't know any professional editors that use Final Cut anymore because they wanted to sort of reinvent things. I'm sure there are, but I mean, like, I don't know any productions that use them. And I used to do, I worked on productions where I used them and where we talked, you know, middle of one where we were talking to Apple about like, well, how can we do this and stuff? And it was funny because that was an experience where I remember some Apple engineers were talking to the production company and they, the, the engineers didn't understand that when you produce like unscripted content, that you're, you may have thousands of hours of media that you're trying to deal with and manage, you know, because you're multiple, you're shooting four cameras at once, you're doing all this stuff in their head, they're thinking feature films, feature films and stuff. And at one point, you know, the, one of the Apple engineers was like, well, you know, Walter Murch has used this on his latest project. And I knew the people who were doing that project with Walter Murch, who's the famous editor, Blink of an Eye is a great book. And I know I'm like, Walter Murch did the final polish. He was not the editor that had to sit through the thousands of hours of footage to do this. Like, yeah, he may have done the final version of Final Cut, but he didn't. They didn't know, you yeah. know, what the workflow was. And, you know, that's a problem that can kind of come up from time to time where we create a tool. It's not what people want because it's not how people are really trying to use it. Yeah, so. yeah. and And... I think that there are there are moments for that kind of change. That there are there are like the best, most remarkable step forwards in in how we use these kind of online tools have always happened when we knew we were ready for a change, even if we didn't say it. Because like that's always the problem is mixing between the like, all right, how much are you willing to adjust what you want to do versus how much are you putting those kinds of thoughts on hold because you never really want to break up your uh, uh, your routine. We all have patterns and processes and 
sometimes we're thrilled that, oh, I can now do a thing in one step that I used to do in three steps. And sometimes it's like, no, 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 I, you totally uh, uh, undercut the reason why I'm doing three steps. Uh, and that's, to me, a uh, notion down to the name, by the way, because I was walking and I had an idea and I go to my phone and I, I do the search and I'm going for notes because I was still uh, uh, in that mind because that's how I used to keep ideas. And I go N-O-T and Notion pops up and I'm like, if that name wasn't on purpose, then <laughs> my God, is that just that that, that was a sign a sign from from the the productivity gods that I had found a new home. <laughs> yeah. Clever. Oh man, it's going to be interesting to see where these tools go. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but I, I I do think that this is Notion is great. It 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 is a big miasma of a lot of things that I would love to see in other in other stuff. I would be shocked if we don't get. Uh, a, a knockoff of this from from Google, uh, you know, in 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 the future, or Apple, or they get bought by Apple or something like that, because it's um, it is it is rad, and and it, and yes, it is a like it's a little unwieldy right now, but man, uh, uh, I was able to catch real quick, and uh, uh, it, it's 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 fun, it's fun to lay things out. Like and yep. and man, can you can you not say enough about that when you're talking about your career and productivity and and wanting to like, oh, I have an idea, fun, I get to put it in my notion. Like that's like I, you can't buy that. And I, I got to give a shout out to my friend Bram Adams. Uh, Bram is a, a developer. He does really kind of cool artistic creative development stuff, and he's the one that got me hooked on this. Showed me. I'd been seen around, seen it, and then I saw how much he just dove into it and was able to use it for a lot of cool things. I'm like, oh, well, this is cool. Yeah. Picks? Uh, I don't know if I could pick anything but uh, uh, Notion. Uh, go get Notion. If just so, when I work with you on a project, you're not like, what is Notion? Do I, I need to download something? <laughs> yeah, I'll second that. I'm going to go against type here. My pick is an article in the Atlantic, which probably maybe I'll pick next week for weird things. But right now it's called how to tell the story of a cult by Sophie Gilbert. Ah. And this was, if you had been listening to us gripe about our problems with the vow and how it felt like eh, they're telling the story in an interesting way, but they're holding back on it, whatever. This compares the versions of The Vow and then Seduced, I think what it was on like Showtime. And basically, kind of like, basically, I felt it's one of those articles like, ah, somebody's saying it. Yeah. So you sent this to me, Andrew, and I loved it. Um, it, it it's it's going to probably make me get Showtime so I can watch the this other uh, Nixium documentary. But like, uh, man, was it was it good to see somebody else say like, oh, no, wait, this is a deliberate thing that they're doing where they're they're kind of trying to protect not only their sources, but also uh, the the their connection to all this footage because they, they need the footage so they can make nine episodes of it. But uh, a lot of great, 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 great initial points uh, in just saying like, oh, wait, like. Isn't it weird that in the vow they don't talk to people outside of this that just discuss cult behavior? And isn't it kind of weird that in the vow they don't discuss things that were like well known and published in in uh, uh you know in in the 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 body journalism that are just never mentioned at all in the vow that would probably make our heroes our protagonists seem a little bit ickier if you ask them on camera hey were you aware of these allegations like uh that's uh, uh well 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 said by the atlantic yeah i was very happy to see it and have it say things that i would never feel comfortable to sort of say <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> It's like, you know, and a totally unrelated thing, like if, you know, Justin and I were actively part of a con, knew we were conning people, and we realized the gig may be up soon, let's become whistleblowers. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Let's uh, grab the hard drives and we're whistleblowing. Hey, guys, you better knock it off. Yeah, man, we're blowing his whistle real big yeah. on all of you goons. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, especially considering where apparently the vow is going in season two, which I think is is borderline unconscionable. But uh, it's uh, uh, fascinating. And now I actually have to watch this other documentary, even though I think I had pretty much had my fill of the Oxenberg family by the time I was done with nine episodes of The Vow. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, it's been after. Hey, that'll do it for us here today. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around. I know we had a little bit of tech issues. Uh, that did not get all ironed out, but, uh, thank you everybody. The guys are going to be back for happy hour in about an hour. Uh, cord killers at six, it's about three hours from now. Uh, Justin yep. Young on Twitch, Andrew Maine on Twitter. And, uh, uh we're going to head off a little quick tonight. Thank you everybody for hanging out. Bye. See you folks. Bye.